it's not a matter of if my child will see porn, it's a matter of when. Depression is not the problem. Depression is a symptom of a problem. It was like going from hot water to cold water instantaneously. So the effect of that is what over time caused a lot of damage to me. Make sure that you tell someone that you know you can trust. I know my songs and stories will bring healing in these days of fear and uncertainty. You are listening to the Under the Rug podcast with Nalini Tranquim. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Under the Rug. I am your host, Nalini Tranquim. Our young are glued to it. Our old are trapped by it. Relationships are destroyed by it. Families are breaking up because of it. Teachers are resigning. Governments are undermining its impact. And if we are not careful, we will have a generation of misogynists and abusers at a level like never seen on earth. Today, we are uncovering the dangers of pornography on society, as well as drilling down to its impact at a family unit level, so that you can walk away more aware of what's going on around you and be better equipped with practical tools so that you can rise up, take responsibility, and make changes to the trajectory of your family's future, and ultimately shift the landscape of society as a whole. It is my honor to introduce to you author, speaker, media commentator, blogger, and advocate, best known for her work addressing sexualization, objectification, harms of pornography, sexual exploitation, trafficking, and violence against women, Melinda Tankard Reese. Welcome to Under the Rug. Thanks for having me, Nalini. I really appreciate your interest in the issue. Yes, of course. Now, Melinda, we have a lot to unpack today, so I'm going to get straight in. If I were to be a chain smoker, I would find myself sitting in my doctor's office asking him for an overall assessment of the condition of my well-being so that I'm fully aware of the impact of my habit, okay? I would like to start today's conversation by asking you, in your experience and with your expertise, What is your overall assessment of the impact of pornography on society's well-being today? Well, uh, Nalini, to use your smoker analogy, I would say that we are uh, fourth and final stage terminal. I've been working on this issue for many years and everything and more that my colleagues and I predicted more than a decade ago uh, has come true. We are seeing now a global rise in uh, adolescents committing uh, sexually aggressive acts on children. This has just been documented in a global journal in the, in the last month of adolescent boys, now the most uh, prominent cohort of sexual abusers of children. Uh, this is the, the fruit of the indoctrination and propaganda of the global pornography industry which has groomed boys to consider girls as existing purely for their pleasure and entertainment. It has developed a taste for violent, sexually aggressive acts. And we are seeing this play out now daily. I'm seeing it in schools. Girls by the thousands are reporting to me the effect on them of of porn-saturated boys. It's a disaster for the boys, it's a disaster for girls, it's a disaster for relationships. And uh, to be honest, I ask, have to ask myself, what kind of civilization uh, are we forming here? Because uh, all the things that we once held to be valuable have been eroded by the indoctrination and impact and proliferation of the global porn industry. So yeah, that's a long answer to your question, but uh, stage four terminal, absolutely. Yikes. This is not good. No, this is not good, Melinda. Um, At what age are children being exposed to pornography? Well, the official figures are around 11 and 12, but I can tell you, Nalini, anecdotally, 
parents contacted me almost every day describing exposure of their child who might have been five, six, seven, eight years of age. You can see this documented on Collective Shouts Kids Exposed page where parents are sharing stories. And these stories include children playing uh, children's games, children typing innocent terms into search engines, children being preyed on in uh, children's uh, sites, chat groups, gaming sites. Uh, so the, it's not a matter of if my child will see porn, it's a matter of when. And parents need to realise this. This is, this is serious. It is dire. Uh, and the child doesn't have to be specifically looking for porn to be exposed to it. They're being exposed on devices. They're being exposed at sleepovers at their friends' houses. They're being exposed on the school bus. Uh, a new phenomenon this year, uh, last year, of uh, that girls were telling me was that um, boys were airdropping porn to any child on the school bus with with a phone. Children are being exposed at the school camp. Um, there is no place that is really safe for children now that pornography won't find them. Mm. The porn industry has created porn sites based on children's most popular cartoon characters. They can be searching for Dora the Explorer, Atomic Betty, Donna, Dorothy the Dinosaur, My Little Pony and see porn. Uh, the porn what industry on earth? has, has de uh, de researched the most common search terms children uh, put into search engines and the mistake that children make. And based on those mistakes, they are directed to a porn, a porn site. This is deliberate because... The porn industry needs to groom the next generation of porn consumers. So, yes, we talk about accidental exposure, but much of it is deliberate. That is the business model of the porn industry. And as a result, we're seeing children acting out on other children in ways that have never been recorded before in history. Uh, little girls telling me at school they're touched, they're groped, they're sexually harassed daily Boys demand nudes from them. Boys send them unsolicited dick pics, even in primary school. Boys are now threatening little girls with rape if they don't send them nudes. The rape threats have grown significantly in the last year. I have young women of colour, even in year seven, telling me that boys tell them that they are their dirty little sex slaves. These are all genres of porn, right? This is not innate to boys. Boys aren't born like this. Uh, they are being socialised, groomed, preyed upon, and uh, we are seeing the results of that uh, every day now. Yo, Flavonek. We're seeing it in our domestic violence frontline services as well. Uh, frontline service providers are telling me they're seeing more porn-inspired injuries in girls than ever before from 14 uh, years and up, um, significant injuries inspired by porn. So we're creating a brutalised, uh, aggressive, callous and, and cruel uh, generation of primarily, primarily boys uh, who uh, are exhibiting these behaviours because they are consuming porn. And this is corrosive to connection. We're, we're emotionally desensitising boys to violence and aggression uh, through porn, through violent game, through toxic social media influences such as Andrew Tate. And what hope is there for them to develop healthy, respect-based relationships, let alone sustain lifelong partnerships and That's right. families and care for, ch for children? Uh, like it, it really is a a monumental tragedy for for everybody yeah no and it cannot be happening on our watch we have got a lot of work to do mm. like you say it's not a matter of if my child is exposed to pornography but rather a matter of when yes so i have parents listening right now mm. thinking well i can't prevent my child from being exposed to porn so what can i do mm -hmm. Well, parents need to act personally and they need to act collectively. So personally, for a start, uh, having rules around devices, having uh, rules around uh, phones, ensuring that children understand uh, red flags for, for predators. Um, 
I include this in my talks, the red flags to watch out for, understand, children need to understand that not everyone online is a friend. Yes, come uh, on. And they're so naive. Uh, they're so trusting. Yeah. Uh, what are the red flags? Well, if they're communicating with someone and that person says, can we make our chat private or don't tell your parents or no one understands you like I do or, you know, send me a picture and I'll send you a, a present. Uh, we're seeing a, a rise of sextortion now um, with uh, more and more young people being tricked and thinking that this is a friend they're talking to uh, and then they're persuaded to send a picture and then they're threatened with blackmail if they don't send more pictures or if they don't send uh, money. So children are at, at risk. Uh, obviously, um, not allowing children uh, unmoderated access to their computers, not having uh, devices behind closed doors. Like if if you knew of a parent that had uh, a stack of porn magazines in their children's bedroom, you think there was something wrong with that, right? Right. Uh, however, we are allowing children behind closed doors with internet-enabled devices oh. full of millions of porn images and full of predators. Uh, why do we make an exception for that? Why do we treat that as, as something different? Yeah. Um, so do you have filtering software? You know, have you looked into the, into the filtering software that's uh, available? Uh, through, for example, uh, Family Zone or uh, Bark Technologies. Uh, have a look at the resources offered by the eSafety Commission. Uh, but then also personally, what are you modelling in the home? What do you tolerate? Mm. Do you tolerate sexist jokes? Do you tolerate violent games? Do you tolerate misogynist music? Um, rap artists, for example, who sing the most vile songs about women. Do you tolerate boys following uh, the Andrew Tates, uh, these malign misogynist influences? Uh, what are you allowing in, in the home? You know, the family is the primary educator of children. And then how uh, if your child comes to you and says they've seen porn, uh, don't have a meltdown in front of them. Don't shame them. Uh, the fact that they've told you is actually a credit to you as a parent. Yes. It's the children who don't tell their parents that I worry about much more. Right. Uh, so try not to, to totally collapse. Take a breath. Tell the child that this ha is common. It happens to kids a lot. Find out where the exposure took place. If it was at school, tell the school authorities. It is likely that other children have been exposed as well. And then look at filtering devices. Look at, um, yeah, was it other friends telling that showing the child porn? Well, maybe you want to raise that with, you know, the parents. Uh, but don't take a shame-based approach because your child will end up in worse places and try to see it as a compliment that they've told you. Then we need to act collectively. Uh, this is an unregulated industry. In Australia, there's no regulation. Your child can see rape porn, torture porn, sadism, incest and bestiality at the click of a button with no proof of age required. And the Australian government has let us down here. Uh, under the previous government, we had um, a commitment on an age verification system to help protect children from porn. One obstacle in the way of accessing hardcore violent porn. Uh, unfortunately, the current government has uh, said last year, late last year, that they weren't going to go ahead even with a trial of an age verification system, even though this is being rolled out in other countries. So we are putting pressure on uh, the government, the communications minister to get this trial back on, on the table. Yes. So if, if your parents, uh, any caregivers, guardians want to get involved in that campaign, please sign up to Collective Shout. It's free to join and we will help you take action on that as just one um, sensible, basic, common sense approach to trying to protect uh, children from this harmful material, which really is deforming their childhoods. It is setting them up for failure. Uh, it is a public health disaster. It's a never before seen experiment on the healthy sexual development of our children. Our children are guinea pigs here. And if we genuinely care for them, uh, care for their well-being then uh, please get involved in Collective Shout and we will help you to take action. So, yeah, acting personally and acting collectively and politically. You know, too, too many parents have been too nice, we've been too polite. Uh, we can't, uh, that's a luxury we can no longer afford. We cannot leave the sexual formation of our children in the hands of the global porn industry. And that's essentially what we're doing if we don't take action. That's exactly right. Oh, that is exactly right. I've got some specific questions uh, for you, Melinda. Um, for parents of girls specifically, how do I teach my daughter 
how to understand potential harm online. Yeah, well, it's it's the harm online, but it's broader than that. It's it's happening every day in their real lived lives. <laughs> so uh, for a start, uh, they need to understand, be helped to understand that they are of more value than what the uh, global porn industry tells them, than a sexualized culture uh, tells them they have innate value and worth mm. that should not uh, be judged and assessed on the basis of purely uh, their hotness, their physical appearance alone and that's what they're taught that's what they're told uh, you have to be hot you have to be sexy you have to get uh, hundreds of likes for your instagram bikini photos uh, you have to be uh, sexually uh, on display you have to act in an exhibitionist way or you have uh, no value and worth so let's model something different to them about their true value and their true worth uh, encourage them to spend time offline all the global research now demonstrates that the longer young people, especially girls, spend scrolling through social media, especially Instagram, their mood goes down. Yeah. This is because they are trying to aspire to so-called uh, social media influencers, Instagram influencers, who are offering a very limited, normative, narrow ideal of what it is to be a woman. And the latest research on this is very powerful. It demonstrates that uh, only five to ten minutes online uh, causes girls' mental health to to take a take a dive. Yikes. In a very short time, very short space of time, uh, girls are more likely to become anxious, depressed, to developing disordered uh, eating behaviours, uh, to self harm. Uh, there's US data that shows that uh, self harm in ten to fourteen year old girls went through the roof since 2009 when we introduced social media and internet enabled devices a mm. 189 percent increase in self-harm in girls since the advent of social media and that's just the 10 to 14 year age group that's been documented by the journal of the american medical association so uh we need to help girls see that they're of more worth than those limited uh, ideas uh, get them offline get them outside, get them doing works of service, good works in the community. That helps their mental health. Um, health, fitness, of course, we, we value that. Not to get a, a hot body, but for so many other reasons, to be, to be strong, to be confident, to take up your rightful place in the world, you know, for her to be all that she can be. We also need to empower our girls to a block, to delete a lot of the time they think they're being mean if they block or delete someone who is hassling them, who is demanding nudes, who is sending dick pics to underage girls, which is criminal, by the way. Uh, and I'll say, why don't you block and delete? Oh, we don't want to look mean. Uh, we need to help our girls to um, put boundaries in place, to say no, to stand up for themselves and their friends. We also need to do more to help them to report sexual harassment, inappropriate behaviours. So in schools, I find that girls are very uh, disempowered, uh, but the school uh, leadership, the school systems don't actually work in the favour of girls uh, reporting. Uh, for example, uh, they should be feel safe to report. We are talking about crimes going on in schools. Schools are legally obliged to create a safe educational environment. They are criminally and civilly liable when they don't do that. Yikes. So girls have a right to sue for the crimes done against them in schools, the touching, the groping, the sexual grunting, the sexual moaning noises. This is all sexual harassment. I talk to girls even in primary school who are daily subjected to groaning and grunting, moaning noises, sexual gestures, uh, being barked at like they are dogs, even in Christian schools for your faith-based listeners. Uh, one of the worst stories I heard was actually in a, a solid Christian school in Queensland where uh, little girls were telling me that not only were they sexually groaned, grunted at, moaned at in the classroom and in the schoolyard, but in the chapel during the daily worship in what? the school, in no. the school's chapel. So you see, pornography has invaded our sacred spaces. Mm. There's no space left for girls to go uh, where they are not subjected to these behaviours. And so uh, girls need to understand this is wrong. They have a right to be safe. They have a right to report and not be given a hard time, not be blamed, not told, well, did you cause it? Did you invite it? Uh, I've had girls tell me that there are more penalties 
for have having say an extra piercing or the length of their uniform or the color of their hair or whatever it is uh, there will be penalties for vaping uh, but they'll say the same day that they got a penalty say for a uniform violation that same day uh, boys made this many rape threats uh, this many rape jokes uh, g- girls were offered hundred dollar notes this was in a christian school to make porn films for this boy and his mates uh, they got an the boys got an after school suspension uh, so the girls don't see uh, fair treatment and they don't see justice being done and then they give up well what does that mean for society if the girls give up and feel they can't safely report or they'll get rumors spread about them and uh, you know schools should be providing a safe educational space so the girls can go to school and focus on learning enjoy being at school enjoy time with their friends I have a theory I can't prove it but I I, I think I have good reason to think this we have seeing a rise in school refusal, right? Why would you want to go to school if you're going to be groped, touched, yeah, harassed, that's it. have porn shoved in your face, that's it. be threatened with rape, have rumours spread about you, have uh, image images created of you using artificial intelligence that turn you into a porn star? That's happening. Girls are discovering that their faces are being used to create porn. Uh, why would you want to go to school? That's right. Uh, the level of violence, the level of harassment, uh, the level of action being taken to protect to protect girls and to call boys out for their behaviour. Because you see, I still hear boys will behave. What the, boys will be boys. What that says is, we don't actually expect better from boys. They don't have any moral agency. They don't have any conscience. Is that what we really believe? That they they have no choice but to act these ways? I don't think so. I actually think that's demeaning and degrading to boys to say you can't help yourself, you can't do any better. And yet I'm still hearing these excuses right now in the 20th century. I was hearing these when I was at school in the 1970s, you know, just saying. So here we are. What what has changed? Well, actually, things have got worse. worse. That's, That's the reality. Yeah, this is not okay. And if people are listening to this and not getting riled up by this, then there is something seriously wrong. And that's part of the problem is, you know, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. And uh, uh, so many people are walking past. Well, that's the reason that we're in, in this mess is because uh, too many people have chose to chosen to, to ignore it or to appease, to make excuses, to take a softly, softly approach. It's not working. It's not serving... Uh, our young people it's not serving our communities and it certainly won't serve uh, future future families that's right well the same way you said earlier that it's important that parents are rising up individually but also collectively our girls need to be rising up individually and collectively Correct. you know so what do you want to say to the teenage girls who are listening to this who are currently mm-hmm. experiencing the pressure of having to send sexualized selfies mm-hmm. to the boys well i speak to this uh, most days in schools around the country and uh, one of the great rewards of this work is uh, hearing from so many girls who say, we realised we're allowed to say no. Come on. Yes. (laughs) Yes. We're allowed to say no. We're allowed to enforce boundaries. We're allowed to stand up for ourselves. We shouldn't be treated this way. Like you can see the lights going on when you have an audience of girls and they they get it. They realise, well, why have we put up with this? Why have we tolerated this? And they decide to demand better for themselves and and for their friends. And it's, it's just hugely rewarding seeing that light go on. Uh, so I would say to, to any girl, you deserve better. You shouldn't have to be uh, treated uh, like this. You ha- shouldn't have to put up with this. You can demand better, you know, demand change in your school, in your community, in your youth group, wherever, wherever you find yourself, demand change. It's not going to change until one girl stands up and says, that's it, I'm done with this. I'm not going to put up with it. I'm going to speak out. I'm going to report it. I have so many girls tell me that after I addressed their school, they reported it. Uh, sexual abuse uh, at the school or historic abuse that they'd never told anyone about because they realized that uh, it wasn't their fault that they shouldn't have been treated this way and they realize that it needs to change they see a ripple effect you know one girl stands up uh, then others can follow and she she creates uh, a path she creates a way 
for other girls to take action. And boys as well, when boys decide not to be bystanders, uh, when they decide to be upstanders, when they decide to speak out, that can give permission for other other boys you know, to do the same. And I believe that's where the change will happen. This generation realizes that uh, porn, porn culture, sexualized society is making them sick. It's not good for them. It's not serving them. It's not helping them. And they want something better. And that, to me, is where the hope lies. We're seeing now more young people globally uh, resisting porn, saying they don't want anything to do with porn. They don't want porn to harm their uh, future relationships. They want to have fuller, richer, more meaningful lives. They want to integrate empathy into their relationships, their friendships, their sexuality. And to me, that's where the hope lies. My generation has really made a mess uh, and left a horrible legacy to our children. However, the young people themselves are rejecting it. And uh, fortunately, also what we're seeing happening uh, politically, globally, is that there's more official acknowledgement now of porn as a driver of violence uh, against women and girls especially. It's acknowledged now by our watch, our peak NGO addressing violence against women in this country. It's in our national plan of action to address violence against women. Uh, it's in global research and data and reports. So this is not a, an opinion that's you know at the margins now. This is uh, now documented. It's evidence based uh, that that porn will destroy uh, relationships, uh, the ability of young people to have healthy, respect based relationships. That it fuels violence and aggression. That it fuels uh, rape myths. The idea that girls secretly want to be uh, raped. And so the more young people that can resist that uh, harmful uh, script, the harmful dictates of the global porn industry, the more hope that we will have. I just thought of another piece of advice I give them, and that is don't date, don't date men who use porn. Don't date boys who use porn. Oh, it's, wow. It's in, it's in my uh, new book uh, called He Chose Porn Over Me, Women Harmed by Men Who Use Porn, 25 Personal Accounts. And some of the women in that book said, I wish I'd heard that advice when I was younger. Don't wow. date men who use porn. And so that's a message that I like to give girls uh, as well. It's not going to go well. You're not going to be treated well. I also talk to girls about red flags uh, in relationships. I also talk to girls about how to detect uh, gaslighting, how to detect coercive control. A lot of teenage girls are suffering coercive control because they don't understand it. Uh, and so this is where they're being emotionally manipulated. They're being controlled. Uh, say, for example, um, boys tracking their every move, uh, never allowing the them to, to uh, turn off their phones, incessantly texting, not allowing them to spend time with uh, family and friends, uh, controlling what they eat is a big one, controlling their money. Um, and it can seem like passion uh, outwardly and girls might like the attention. Uh, however, uh, it's not going to go well for them. No. So um, I've had girls tell me they've broken up with boys after hearing me speak because they realised they were being controlled, that this wasn't an authentic, caring, loving uh, relationship. So that's become a greater need now for girls to be given the tools to recognise and understand uh, what's a red flag in a relationship, what's a green flag in a relationship, what do they want for themselves, what are they prepared to endure and to put up with because they're putting up with way too much, you know. Yeah. And uh, I say to them, you are better off on your own, you are better off single than in a relationship that's going to be damaging and harmful uh, to you. Okay, so just on that, what are some of the green flags then that us girls need to be looking out for in men? Yeah, absolutely. Well, what the girls themselves say are things like um, he's kind to his family. They look at how he treats his mother, which is interesting. They look at how he treats children, uh, which is interesting. They come up with some really insightful uh, things. Uh, they'll say... Um, you know, does he does he put others first? Is he all about himself? Is he um, is he vaping? Is he gaming? Is he a big drinker? They see all that as as red flags. But if he doesn't do those things, they think that's that's really good. They'll say things like, um, "Does he shop at Woolworths?" And I ask, "Why is that a green flag?" And they say, "Because he's okay about just doing an ordinary like grocery shop." Wow. Uh, he, he, like simple things like that, they find appealing. Uh, is he generous? Is he kind? Is he thoughtful? Uh, is he not demanding naked pictures? Um, yeah, how he treats other people is a really is a really big one. Here's another interesting one that came out recently in the last school I did. The number of girls that looked at how does he treat 
hospitality and retail workers mm. was really, really, was really interesting. Does he allow you to have time with your girlfriends? Does he respect your own time, your own need to do your own thing? Or does he want to be with you, you know, every second of the day? How does he speak about other girls is a big one. Wow. Does he put them down? Does he make sexist comments about girls' bodies? Does he make sexist jokes? Here's another big one. Does he change towards you when he sees mates coming? Because mm. a lot of girls will say he really changes. He uh, when he sees his mates, he shifts, becomes a bit more standoffish, a bit more cold, a bit more controlling, mean. They notice that. Uh, so the boys that don't do those things are are very attractive to the girls. Wow. Yeah. I'm putting all this in a new book, by the way. So good, Melinda. It's yeah, needed. Yeah, red flags, green flags. Yeah, it is needed. Yeah, I actually want to encourage parents listening to this, if you're a parent of a teenager, to have your teenagers listen to this podcast because it's going to be invaluable for them to hear it for themselves also. Yes, yes. So shifting the conversation slightly then, for parents of boys... How do we raise our boys to rise above toxic messages of masculinity to become men of integrity? Yes. Well, again, I think it has to start with the, the modelling, uh, particularly of males in their lives, uh, fathers, if there's fathers around, where there's not fathers, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, a good uncle, an older cousin, or some uh, male mentor in a community group or a, or a youth group. Uh, finding you know good men that can get around that that young man to help him to resist uh, the the lure of these toxic messages, uh, helping educate them about the Andrew Tates of this world. Well, uh, Andrew Tate wants to control women. He's profited from uh, selling women's bodies. He's you know on multiple charges for for trafficking, etc. Uh, just because he tells you to you know, drink water and to be fit doesn't make him a, a model of, you know, exceptional manhood. Uh, why do you want to follow this controlling model? Girls tell me that any boys following Andrew Tate treat them worse. They treat them worse. Uh, they put them down. They want to control them. They want to limit them. They tell them, you know, go into the kitchen and make me a sandwich. Uh, they see them in only in sort of sexual terms. So modelling, modelling healthy masculinity, we just don't see enough of that in the culture. If you look at the kind of men that get rewarded in this culture, you know, often it's sportsmen that do the wrong thing or it's, it's rap artists singing the most vile lyrics uh, about, about women. Um, you know, it's, it's men who do the wrong thing that still get accolades and still get praised, um, that get away with sexual ab abuse and harassment of, of women, even at the highest levels. I mean, this goes back to our porn issue here. Think about this. This generation of, of young men have been raised on porn, groomed by porn, taught that, um, you know, women deserve to be treated in violent, sexually aggressive ways, that they've, they've learned a sense of entitlement. Think about this. They will become our police officers. They will become our members of parliament. They will become, God help us all, our judges, our law enforcement, <laughs> making decisions in rape trials and sexual harassment cases uh, where they've been groomed on porn themselves. Is there a reason that we see such uh, low sentencing rates? Mm. I mean, community service for accessing, consuming, you know, millions of images of child sexual exploitation. You get community service, you go pick up rubbish somewhere. I mean, this is the reality. And Australian men are in the top three highest consumers in the world of child sexual exploitation material and live distance streamed abuse of children in the Philippines, for example, where they can just dial up live, live abuse of a child. Um, and yet the penalties aren't that, aren't that severe. That's something we've been working on, a, a collective shout. So one, what are we modelling? Uh, and what are we doing to change the culture? That, again, goes to our, our political question here. Uh, why, why is so much of this work being done by women? Like, for example, you know. Yeah. Uh, I can get asked, what are you doing for men? Well, we're actually doing a lot for men. But for the, for the man that's asking me, what are you doing for men? Like, you want me to organise your sausage sizzle on your diary dates? Like, maybe you could do something for men. We can't, we can't do it all. That's exactly having right. Having said that, we do work with some really good men globally. And we have a very good, some very good male allies that are working in this space alongside us, which is great. 
uh, but we need our you know our, our male politicians to do more yes why why is it acceptable to any man in parliament uh, to to not support age verification for example to protect children from porn I mean you know we say this to any MP of course but you're asking me specifically about about men and boys here so we need a total radical cultural shift in in the raising of young men uh, I believe we have failed to raise a generation of healthy young men we've we've failed the boys and I, I want to know why we're not producing better young young men mm. why why haven't we done a better job of that in, in our schools in our in our community more more broadly to me this is the this is a major question of the of our current times is the lack of formation of of boys i mean these boys are doomed to fail if they're consuming porn they're gaming day and night they're not focusing on their their studies they're totally uh distracted they're totally controlled by the mob um, the tribe uh, the gang uh in their you know in their behavior they're not taught to aspire to something better richer higher you know how are these boys going to make a good contribution to society uh when they are you know, getting off on porn day and night. That's right. And I mean, this includes our so-called leaders, including in churches, like upwards of 80% regularly consuming porn. Yeah. Like, you know, you're not going to change the world that way, just saying. Um, so, yeah, that's a huge, que- it's a huge question, uh, is the question of our failure to, to raise good boys. So, you know, if you're raising a good boy parent, thank you so much. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you for yes. the good boys. You know, and they, it does give me hope and I meet good boys. And they pay a price for being good. They are called names. They are bullied. They are called simps. Uh, they are abused. They're often um, beaten up. They're verbally uh, bullied and put down just for being decent, just for basic decency. And yet uh, the girls like that. They like to see that there are good boys, that there are emotionally intelligent, empathetic yeah. young men that they can talk to, have a good conversation with, who aren't sexualizing them, that aren't trying to get into their pants, that aren't trying to get a nude picture. Uh, so to those boys, you know, good on you, stay strong, hold strong. And uh, I'm sorry it's been so hard for you, uh, but uh, you will be ultimately, you know, rewarded. You, yes, You've got absolutely. your intre- integrity, you know, you're a young man of integrity. And yes. you've paid a price for that, but, you know, you can hold your head head high. And uh, there will be future rewards for that. That's exactly right. You are going to make a magnificent husband one day. And even if not, even if, you know, marriage isn't on the cards just yet, yeah. uh, you can still hold your head high for being a decent member of humanity. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. And modelling something better to other young men. So how do I, as a parent, ensure that my son is porn harm literate? Mm. Yeah, well, we need to have these conversations early and uh, I offer two books for parents. One uh, is called uh, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, which you read uh, to your child. Uh, it's for children like six years old and up, which again is a tragedy. Uh, but uh, if we are not having these conversations with our child, someone else is and they may not share our values and our desires for our child. Uh, I have another book called How to Talk to Your Kids About Porn. Simple, easy to read, accessible. Uh, to have these difficult conversations help your uh, young person especially your boy to see uh, that porn will consume them they will end up in places they never thought they would end up in Uh, i've talked to young men who ended up consuming child pornography they never thought that when they first started out but you see the brain becomes acclimatized and the brain needs harder content to get that same dopamine hit the power of uh, porn has been compared to the power of crack cocaine in terms of the impact on the dopamine receptors in the brain, right? But they become immune uh, to, I hate to even use this word, but to the sort of standard, you know, basic porn. It's, and then they end up needing more fetishized content, more hardcore violence. The most popular genres of porn are the most violent. So rape, torture, um, sadism, extreme degradation and torture of women. Like it's not even about, you know, watching couples have sex. <laughs> it's way beyond that. It's, yeah. it's torture. And we've documented the experience of uh, women that were in the porn industry and that have now uh, left. And they, they say, you know, they were, they were injured. They uh, um, couldn't demand, uh, you know, even like protection, condoms, 
they uh, had to agree to more and more hardcore content um, because there's so much of it out there that you you have to be willing to suffer um, and be mistreated. And and that's if we are allowing boys to be aroused mm. by extreme torture and no. degradation of women, it's not this okay. does not all go well for society. This does not go well. No, it does not. So helping our young men see they're not going to be set up well for life. They're not. But also helping them feel they can talk to you about it. Yeah. Uh, that if they uh, have developed a, a, a habitual behaviours around porn, that you are there for them. You're there to help them. Uh, they can find online resources, fight the new drug, um, resistporn.org for, for uh, faith-based families, uh, Reboot Nation, uh, for example, where they can find online support. Uh, but I also really prefer the online support is fantastic, don't get me wrong, but they need to look someone in the eye. Where are our safe groups of men having these conversations in our, in our communities, in our uh, youth groups, and being accountable to another uh, male, preferably being accountable, talking, you know, being honest, uh, having accountability um, software, for example. Look, the only men that I've met who were able to break their porn consuming habits uh, took radical action, like radical action. They smashed up phones, they smashed up computers, or they only allowed themselves online for limited times a day. Um, they had accountability uh, friends, um, they were transparent, they were upfront, they did everything it took to get free. Right, because this is a very controlling habit. Uh, one argument that I used um, that I use with men is uh, if it doesn't mean enough to you that uh, you won't be a nice uh, human being or that you will develop erectile dysfunction, which we're now seeing in teenage boys again, never recorded before in history. Uh, but I talk to doctors who say they have more teenage boys now coming to them with erectile dysfunction because they have so um, glutted on porn that real girls, real women don't arouse them now because oh, they have this you know, online harem of, of, of everything. And so they're not even aroused by normal uh, human connection, skin-on-skin -skin contact uh, with a partner. But if those things don't mean enough, if self-interest doesn't mean enough, I say this, you've become a patron of the global sex industry. You are contributing to trafficking you don't know if that young woman's been trafficked or not. There's no sort of dolphin-free tuna version of porn. We know that women are trafficked into the sex industry, not just in prostitution, but to make pornography, right? Those industries go together. They work together. Of course. Um, often the same people are behind them. And uh, you've become a patron of that industry, mm. which traffics women, underage children, uh, to make these products that you're now consuming how do you feel about that? Does that feel good to you? And I've had boys tell me uh, that it was that argument that helped them to stop. Wow. Because they realised every download was driving the global pornography, the global sex trade trafficking industry. And they realised that ethically, if they still had a conscience, they didn't want to be part of that. And if our men rose up, there would be no industry. Correct. The, the demand, right? You've got to address the demand. Every man that is downloading porn today has created that demand for the bodies of millions of vulnerable women and girls and little boys as well on a global scale, right? And you're, you're part of that. So face that and make amends. Mm. Make amends. Do everything you can uh, to uh, free yourself uh, and end, end the industry. Yeah, exactly. We put a call out to our listeners asking for any questions that they may have mm -hmm. on the topic of pornography. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions asked is, mm. what do you say to the couple who watch mm -hmm. porn together thinking that it helps their intimacy? Oh, God. Well, for, for a start, I'd love you to read uh, my book, He Chose Porn Over Me, Women Harmed by Men Who Use Porn. Uh, often the pathway is not that the woman wants to view it. Often the pathway is the man wants the woman to view it with him. Yeah, um, and that's what I've been told by by many women. It wasn't actually something they really wanted to do. It's something he wanted to do, to you know spice up their sex life. Uh, the women that I've interviewed on this, I didn't really love it. Didn't really enjoy it. Could see that he actually couldn't be aroused by her on her own. He needed the porn for the arousal. I speak to teenage girls in high schools who tell me. Uh, that their boyfriends uh, cannot climax without porn playing in the background. And we are talking 15 and 16 year olds, right? So I would say, uh, look at the, your relationship 
uh, perhaps there's something lacking there that he, mostly he, wants to introduce porn into the relationship. And what happens when the so-called, and again, I don't like this word, but the so-called vanilla porn doesn't do it for him anymore. Where's, where's he going to want to go next? And what if he starts demanding of the woman, and this is recorded in my book, he chose porn over me, what happens when he wants to choke and strangle her, when he wants to ejaculate on her face, mm. when he wants to engage in so-called breath play where she uh, nearly dies as a result of strangulation, uh, which is a hugely popular porn genre. What happens if he wants a threesome? Are you happy with that? Um, what happens if he thinks it's okay to to use women in the sex industry? Uh, these are all, you know, pathways, trajectories that happen to the women in, in my book. Uh, uh, so, again, ask yourselves those questions. I was on a TV show once on porn, and it was very pro, very pro porn. And there was a couple there who were put up as the couple that, you know, porn has enriched their relationship and their marriage, and, you know, they spoke to this. The woman quietly took me aside afterwards and says, actually, I hate it. And mm. I wish he wouldn't make me use it with him. Whoa. Right. So, and again, uh, again, look at what you're consuming. Uh, do you know those women were, you know, willingly there in, in the industry? Like, really? <laughs> You've become part of a global tr trade. That's right. That's uh, that exactly is um, right. destructive, that is violent, that is harming every woman and girl in the world right, that is reducing the status of women on a global scale yeah. and you, you want to be part of that and yeah. Yeah. do that under the guise of, oh, well, it's enhancing yeah. our marriage, really? Yeah. Like you don't want to try something else to enhance your marriage? And is this really the kind of person you want to be, be married to, just yeah. saying? Yeah. yeah, it's demonic. It's from the pit of hell. What do you say to the person or the couple addicted to pornography who have listened to your warnings today and who desperately want to be free of the grip mm -hmm. of porn going forward? Okay, well, do everything you can to get free. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of the time in my book, uh, the man would claim to want to get free but wouldn't take any steps to get free. Exactly. And she was expected to do all the work, right. make all the appointments, make all the bookings, set up the therapist. I didn't like that therapist. Find me another therapist. Uh, if he's serious about changing, prove it, show it, show it. Yeah. What are you doing? Come on. Uh, I've interviewed women whose um, husbands were consuming porn in front of the children or the children would come into the room and see him masturbating to porn. Like, really? Is this, is this the kind of marriage? Is this the kind of husband you want? What are they doing? What, how serious are they? If they're serious, they'll get every accountability software. They'll get every internet blocking device. They'll, if necessarily, hand over their phones. Uh, they will... Find a, a, a support group and, and be transparent um, and prove, you know. And she doesn't need to stay for that to happen. Like sometimes it was the woman uh, leaving. Leaving, yes. That caused him to realise what he had, what was at stake. But a lot of men didn't care. They didn't care if they lost their wives, their children, their house. Wow. A lot of them really didn't care. So if they're genuine, they'll, they'll show it. Yes. They'll okay. prove it. No, that's good. But don't tolerate it. Don't tolerate it. Yeah. And don't make excuses. Yeah. When our youth become aware of the dangers of pornography, mm. I believe that justice rises up on the inside of them and then they become the next generation of activists. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to say to our teenagers who say no to porn mm. and want to be a part of the solution going forward? Yeah, well, good on you. Good on you for recognising the harm. Good on you for demanding something better for yourself. Uh, good on you for not succumbing to the toxic scripts of the global uh, porn industry. Good on you for valuing yourself and for wanting more than just um, hookups, disposable uh, connections, emotionless, um, meaningless um, sex. <laughs> That's pretty common, just by the way. Uh, good on you for wanting something better for yourself. So uh, become part of the movement. You don't have to be on your own. You're not a freak. You're not hung up. Uh, there's nothing wrong with you. Join Collective Shout. We are wanting to start a youth uh, movement within Collective Shout, a um, youth-led movement of activism against sexualization, objectification, porn, uh, porn culture, violence, um, something that will promote healthy respect-based relationships, help young people to uh, enforce boundaries, clarify their values, 
Uh, so join Collective Shout. You'll feel, you'll feel less lonely. Yeah, very and, good. And uh, we can make the change together, cultural change, social transformation, you know, a, a better world. Turn it back before it's, before it's too late because, as I said, we're already at stage four terminals. So, yes, exactly. You know, help us turn this around. Yeah, for sure. What do you believe our schools should be doing in order to combat this very present evil in our corridors and classrooms? Well, the schools have so, uh, so much uh, influence and uh, I'm actually working more with schools now uh, on compliance helping them to be compliant with state law, federal law, the Royal Commission, um, uh, other regulatory uh, frameworks, because uh, I rarely find a school that is compliant with the law. So I help them to understand the problem. Here's the problem. Here's the issue. Here's what's going on at your school. Here's what your young people have told me. Uh, and here's what you need to do address it. So here's what the law says. Here's, the, here's um, reporting pathways that you can implement Here's um, how you can provide safe reporting spaces for young women and young men in your schools. Also, here's how you can address uh, sexual harassment of students, but also teachers. So at Collective Shout, we've partnered with Maggie Dent, parenting expert. Uh, we conducted a survey to do with sexual harassment of teachers. And a lot of female teachers are leaving teaching because they're being touched, groped, harassed. They're having photos taken up, uh, their skirts, uh, they're being aggressed against they're uh, being sexually groaned and moaned at. Uh, so what are the schools doing? I run case studies. I run like daily work, day, day workshops with schools. And last year I uh, worked with uh, a large number of schools in far north uh, Queensland and I did case studies with them. Okay, if this happens, what would you do? And uh, it was identified that there was no clear reporting pathways Mm. Uh, so what's the chain of command where you know you're hearing boys making sexual groaning noises at girls where do you go is it the year leader is it the principal is it the parents uh, is it the union is this an ohs issue when do we bring in the police yeah and uh, a lot of schools feel overwhelmed by the problem they're overwhelmed already with just trying to educate students um, given the current sort of cultural uh, pressures and complex mental health issues social media Violence in schools is increasing, violence student on student and student on teacher is increasing. So they've got so many issues already. Um, and on top of that, you've you know, introduced porn inspired behaviors, primarily from boys. So schools need help. And uh, I've got a, a new package that I'm rolling out this year for, for school leadership wow. uh, with myself, uh, with a safeguarding specialist, child safeguarding legal uh, expert. So good. And also with a leading child psychiatrist to help to, to deal with the, the uh, mental and emotional fallout, mental and emotional harm in children who are uh, perpetrating and children who are victims of that perpetration. So uh, you, you're hearing it here first. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a new offering to wow. try to help schools, to help their young people, to help their teachers, uh, to try to work this out. This is a whole of community approach. It can't be parents on their own. It can't be schools on their own. That's right. Uh, it's too hard. It's too big. Yeah. We need parents, communities, schools, governments, regulatory bodies to work together. Yes. To acknowledge what the research says. Come the evidence on. is solid now. And to say, well, what are we going to do? Do we care about this next generation? Do we care about our children or not? Because they are the guinea pigs in this never before seen experiment we have to ask ourselves the bigger questions well what kind of society do we do we want what kind of civilization do we want that's right and let's work together to try to bring that about exactly yes exactly mm. gosh roll it out in australia and then i think you need it rolled out across the earth correct melinda yes well we're working with our global allies uh, on, on this issue it's, it's it's too big to deal with on our own it really is keeping in mind that our audience is international um what do you want to see governments doing around mm -hmm. the world on this matter? Well, we are doing this now. We are working on this now. We are working with uh, global allies whose governments have uh, done the right thing. So uh, right now there's, I think, currently five to six countries rolling out proof of age protections for children. Oh, wow. So Australia needs to follow suit on yes, that. Yes, come on. Uh, we are also working with our global partners in a campaign to bring down Pornhub, the biggest dispenser of misogyny and violence in the world, the most popularly visited site of boys. Mm. Pornhub has been implicated in trafficking, 
uh, child sexual abuse videos, rape videos, non-consensual image sharing. And uh, right now they are being sued by something like 109 women uh, for using their um, rape videos that were filmed without consent when they were um, uh, made drunk or um, given drugs, um, abused and filmed. Yeah. And yeah. so this is the first time ever we've seen uh, the porn industry brought to account. Uh, this has been led by a remarkable colleague of ours, uh, Leila Micklethwaite, uh, who's done an extraordinary job exposing uh, all of the unethical behaviour of this giant misogyny dispensing machine that is Pornhub, headquartered in Canada, by the way, not some rogue state, headquartered in Montreal, Canada. Um, parent company is, is called MindGeek. And uh, they've had to give account in the Canadian Parliament for what they've done. They've removed something like 20 million videos so far. And so that's another campaign we're part of. Uh, we also have global campaigns against, uh, this is a really horrendous, so trigger warning here, but uh, child sex abuse dolls. So these are replica children, infants, toddlers and babies modelled on real children, custom made. It's a global trade. It's massive. We got it banned here in Australia. We want other countries to roll out the same laws that we have in Australia against replica children for child abuse. So uh, these are lifelike, realistic, anatomically correct and often custom made in the likeness of real children. So we're working with our uh, global partners to get other countries to enact laws modeled on Australia's law, which on this is very good. Replica children and body parts, can you believe it, for sexual use. A new campaign we're about to launch is against uh, AI, uh, so-called artificial intelligence. Uh, there are multiple artificial intelligence accounts on uh, popular social media pages, including Instagram, uh, which are modelled on real children, so therefore sexual fetish use. They're modelled on real little boys, real little girls, and uh, very popular. Uh, and just because it's artificially generated doesn't mean it isn't based on real children. It's based on real children, and we need stronger laws uh, to stop that. So as you can see, we are fighting on many related fronts. It's a huge task. We're a very small team. Uh, right now, it's me and three women all working part-time, and we run these global campaigns. We punch above our weight. Uh, but if any of you listeners wanted to support us, we need all the help we can get with volunteering, with fundraising. Uh, we are tax deductible, so uh, your gift will help us to achieve a greater victories. Last year alone, we had 23 victories in 2023. We have had victories against global corporations, Alibaba was hosting child sex abuse dolls and replica body parts. We got them down in a few weeks. We got down, uh, we bought down three porn magazines in this country, Zoo, Picture and People. Picture and People, which were, which were at children's eye level in corner stores, milk bars, 7-Eleven, were in Australia for 80 years. We got rid of them in mm. about seven weeks. Wow. We bring down sexist billboards, um, sexualized children's uh, clothing, uh, we stopped Wicked Campers, which had the uh, anti-women slogans painted all over the vans. We got um, state governments to agree to deregister those vans if they didn't get rid of their anti-women uh, slogans. So we really do punch above our weight. Yeah. Uh, you can have a look at our website and see all the victories that we had last year alone, but with more support, more human resources, exactly. uh, more financial support, we know we could do so much more. We're hoping this year will be even bigger than last year. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, with the support of your listeners, that could be possible. One more question for you, Melinda, yes. before we close. What do you want to see churches around the world actively mm -hmm. doing to help shift mm -hmm. the landscape of society? Well, faith-based communities around the world should be uh, at the forefront of yeah. demonstrating what healthy relationships look like. And again, I have to ask, uh, where's the failure there? Why haven't you produced better young men, for example? Because girls in youth groups are telling me stories that are as bad as what I'm hearing uh, outside the faith-based communities. So I have to ask why. I have to ask why there's so much porn use being tolerated in, in churches, why so many church leaders are consuming porn, why there's so much cover-up of violence against women and girls in, in churches. I know I'm generalising and I work with a lot of good faith-based communities, so please don't misunderstand me here. Yeah. But, you know, I, I feel I'm here to report what's going on and report the truth and... 
Uh, I can only report what, what I hear everywhere I go, you know. So churches should be taking the lead. I mean, we churches claim to be connected to the author of love. They should know what the best love looks like. They should That's be exactly modeling right. the purest, realest, most wondrous thing, you know. Yeah. Um, love between between people, healthy relationships. Uh, I want churches to understand uh, how how porn has invaded our sacred spaces. Yeah. yeah. To provide safe spaces to talk about it. To provide uh, redress, accountability. Yes. To, come to on. help women that come for help. Like this is documented in my He Chose Porn book. The number of women that sought help from their pastors and didn't get it. Mm. Or were just told, well, all men do that. Or you just need to give provide more sex. Or, you know, don't make him feel bad. Or... Uh, the amount of uh, appeasement was 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 very disheartening. I must say, yeah. Nalini, it really was. So, uh, providing you know safe spaces for women to talk, providing accountability programs for for men, having these conversations yeah. in your in your youth groups. Um, so many things that churches could be doing in this space. Yeah. You know? yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. If we don't act now, then when? And if not you, then who? exactly yes yeah so now's the time and we can't delay it's urgent it's desperate and uh you know i feel that you know if churches get this right they could provide an example um you know to the world of what of what um, healthy loving intimate caring respectful relationships look like and be a beacon of light to uh to the world which is looking for something better you know exactly they know there's got to be something better than what's on offer right now that's right Mm. Melinda, any closing thoughts that you want to leave our audience today? Well, naturally, I'm going to say we need you. Collectiveshout.org is our website. It's free to sign up. If you sign up, you'll hear from, from me. If you, I hope that you'd like to. Uh, we will uh, put you in touch with others that feel the same way. Uh, that's the strength of Collective Shout is that collective voice. will help you to act personally, how to act collectively. Uh, like all of our social media pages. Uh, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Uh, we are reluctantly on, on TikTok because we need to be where young people are. Mm-hmm. Um, like us across all those platforms. Share our petitions. It doesn't take long to hit retweet. It doesn't take long to share a petition. Our petitions often result in success. And be prepared to get your hands dirty, you know. Don't say, oh, we're glad you're out there doing it, getting your head kicked in, you know. Uh, maybe you could do it too and we could achieve more together. You know, and you don't have to be necessarily uh, the front person, but there's so much you can do behind the scenes to support what we do. And we have a volunteer program. You can ask uh, for more information about that. Yeah, fundraise. Uh, invite us to your school. Invite us to your to your church, your community group, uh, your company, your small business. Which prompts me to mention this. We also have a corporate social responsibility pledge. Uh, if any uh, businesses out there, companies are not sexualizing women and girls in their advertising and marketing and products and agree with everything we're talking about today, if you sign our pledge, uh, we will promote you to thousands of supporters around the wow. country. Yes, wow. we smack the bad guys and we name and shame them and we tell you who not to shop with every Christmas. We have a list of offenders to avoid. But we also want to honor the good companies, the good small businesses that don't engage in in unethical practices, that believe in corporate social responsibility, uh, we will honour you and we will we will promote you to thousands of people. I love that. So please, yeah, get on board. We're trying to do, you know, we have positive initiatives as well. So good. For turning this mess around. So, so good. Melinda, thank mm. you so much for your a time pleasure. today. To all my listeners, if a compass doesn't provide the coordinates, how does one know where they are going? If men and women of integrity who still carry a moral compass don't rise up and lead the way, the next generation will fall into the precipice of demise on our watch. We have a responsibility before our children, our partners, our loved ones who ultimately make up our society and therefore we cannot sit scrolling in the shadows. We must take action now. If today's episode has raised any questions or matters of the heart have bubbled to the surface, then please reach out info at nalinitranquim.com. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to the Under the Rug podcast with Nalini Tranquim. To learn more about Nalini's online coaching programs, to book Nalini for your upcoming events, or for more information, please visit nalinitranquim.com forward slash contact or email us at info 
at nalinitranquim.com.